Show of hands. How many people are tired right now? Yeah, your brain hurts. You ready to go home? All right, I'll try to make this keynote really quick. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Best keynote ever. All right. One of the things, where am I? Here. One of the things that will frequently happen when I go to conferences and I'm asked to speak on various topics and so forth is people will ask me questions. They'll ask me questions about, you know, the web frameworks, particularly if you're at a Java show because they've got like four million of them. And they'll ask me, okay, well, which languages should I use? Which platform should I use? Should I be thinking about Node.js or should I be thinking about .NET Core or should I be thinking about, you know, .NET 4.6 versus 4.5? What about F Sharp? Should I be thinking about F Sharp? What about all the different NoSQL databases, right? MongoDB and CouchDB and there's yours and my and his and her DB. Everybody's got a DB these days. And what I've discovered over the years, I've been doing this speaking thing for probably about 20 years now. And what I've discovered is that most of these questions all tend to be a mask. They're really a, a, a hidden question for the one question that everybody really, really wants to know. Give me the thing that will like make things better, that will keep me from being outsourced, etc. How do I avoid getting fired? The really ironic thing about doing this talk here is that in many cases, it's consulting companies in Eastern Europe that are doing the outsourcing that is firing American programmers. So it's really kind of fun to be talking to you guys about how to avoid getting fired because it's because of you guys that people in the States are getting fired. No, 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 no. India actually is being replaced by Poland, right? See, it's a, it's a circle, right? And eventually, you know, eventually America will be crappy enough that American programmers will replace Polish programmers. But that's only if Trump gets elected. <laughs> the hands, they're huge, they're huge. All right. This question is actually a very fundamental one, and it's an important one because in many respects, I mean, let's be blunt, the industry keeps moving, right? If you wanted to be in an industry where stuff never changed at all, you would be in, well, pretty much any other industry other than this one. You would drive taxi cabs. Oh, no, wait, Uber, sorry. Um, you would be a doctor. Oh, no, wait, WebMD, never mind. You would do something but you wouldn't be a programmer because this industry, far more than any other industry I've ever seen, is constantly reinventing itself. So this is actually a pretty fair question for you to ask, you know, seriously, what stuff should I be paying attention to? What stuff should I, in fact, be thinking about, discussing? We even talked about it a little bit on the panel last night. So this is a very, very relevant and reasonable question. But I have about another hour to fill. So we'll table that question, and I'm going to ask you guys a question instead. Given that we have a triangle with the points A, B, and C, I want you to prove that the length of the lines from AC to CB is greater than the length of the lines from AD to DB. Who's up for that? Nobody. Maybe a hand, I can't see anything with the lights in my eyes. All right, maybe that one's too hard. Let me try another one. Imagine we have a well, and we throw a couple of sticks into the well, and the well has a diameter of three meters. The, the sticks land so that they cross. I want you to tell me the height off the bottom where the sticks cross. Who's good for that? There's a couple of people who are pointing at the screen, but nobody's like, ah, oh, I could do it, I could do it. All right, let's try one other one. Imagine we have a farm that it's a rectangular ranch um, and it has a perimeter of 110 meters and an area of 700 square meters. What's the height and width of this ranch? You got it? 
You can you can tell me the answer, or you just you kind of think you know how to solve it. You can solve it, but not immediately. We'll take a future on that. Maybe it's a future with a potential exception. Is that what you're telling me? Maybe. All right, we'll get back to you later. I'm asking these questions for a reason. But here's a last one. It's a little bit more of a, of a logic riddle than anything else. A mathematician, right, because, you know, we just have mathematicians wandering around the street all day long. A mathematician runs into an old friend of his, and the friend says, hey, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And the mathematician says, oh, you know, I'm still doing math things. And the friend says, oh, well, yeah, you're a mathematician. You should be able to guess correctly the age of my three sons. The mathematician says, well, I, I need some kind of information before you can do that. He says, all right, the product of their ages, S1 times S2 times S3, the product of their ages is 36. And the sum of their ages, S1 plus S2 plus S3, is equal to the number of books on that table over there. And the oldest has blue eyes. And the mathematician says, oh, I got it. I know exactly how old your sons are. How many of you can do that? One hand, very judiciously there in the darkness. Oh, one in the very far back as well, where he knows he's not going to be called on. <laughs> the first three problems that I showed you came from an elementary school mathematics textbook. The fourth one requires no more complex math than what you learned by about the age of 10. Feeling stupid yet? It's okay. You are not alone. As a matter of fact, the United States, you're going to love this one. If you haven't run across this, the United States actually made a game show, a television game show out of this, are you smarter than a fourth grader? And they will literally take grown adults off the street and put them up against 10 and 11 year old school children and ask them questions out of fourth and fifth grade curriculum. And the kids usually win. So if you're looking at these problems and you're thinking, you know, there was a time in my life I knew how to do that, but Hell, if I remember how to do it now, it's okay, you're not alone. Because as it turns out, when we show the triangle problem to a number of people, including undergraduate, graduate students, and even full professors in mathematics, engineering, or computer science, people teaching, not just attending, but people teaching at university, when we show them these problems, fewer than 5% of them solved it in an hour. Many of them required several hours, and we witnessed some outright failures as well. Full professors in mathematics couldn't solve these problems in a fourth grade textbook. The well problem itself takes less than a minute to solve, but if you get it within an hour, you belong to the elite 1% of the people who managed to get the right answer within that time. What's more, everyone we tested had at least an undergraduate degree in either mathematics, engineering, or computer science. You are not alone. Which then raises the most important question. Seriously, what's going on here? I mean, these are problems, like I said, they come out of an elementary school mathematics textbook, but a professor teaching at a university level can't solve them? Something is seriously askew here. Something is wrong. And part of the problem is the way in which we think about learning. It's the way in which we store education inside of our heads. We're taught to decompose problems and treat the smaller, simpler problems individually. We look at these problems frequently in the abstract. Complex, real-world problems don't often decompose easily or meaningfully. 
It's very rare that you'll be walking around on your property or you'll be wandering down the street and there's a well and we throw a stick in and then we throw another stick in and then say, gosh, I wonder how high the intersection is off the bottom of the well. We don't do that on a daily basis. That just doesn't happen very often. I mean, wandering down the street, you run into a buddy who's a mathematician at university. Okay, stop right there. How many people do you actually, how many times do you see professors from university walking the streets, period? They're, they're in their ivory towers, staring out over the world. They don't ever walk the street like the rest of us. We don't see these problems. When's the last time you had a train leaving from Warsaw and then another train leaving from Krakow, and we need to figure out when they will run into one another. Which is a classic word problem that American students love to hate. We don't ever see these problems in the real world. We are often, we are spoon-fed the solutions to problems chapter by chapter, never once being forced to think about whether or not the problems we are facing should be solved with the technique we just described in our textbook. You are taught how to do long division, and then you are presented with problems containing long division. Why else would this problem be in this chapter? We know, starting from a very young age, that any problem that you receive as a part of your homework, as a part of a quiz, as a part of a test, we know that whatever we learned this week will apply to this particular problem. It is one of the fundamentals of education. You're taught a thing, you're tested on the thing. You're taught a different thing, you're tested on the different thing. You're taught a third thing, you're tested on the third thing. And then, oh my God, horror of horrors, comes the final where you might be tested on the stuff that you learned this quarter, 10 weeks. Oh my God, I have to remember everything I learned in 10 weeks. And once this class is over, fuck it. Who cares? I will never take that final again. I got my grade, I'm done. I will never have to use the C++ programming language ever again in real life. And there are a couple of people who are laughing and they're like, wait, why is nobody else laughing? That was supposed to be funny, right? I will actually use C++ someday? Oh, God. This is not just true for elementary mathematics. This holds true for just about everything. When you're taught history, you're tested on the things you were taught about history. We're taught about the, uh, you know, we're, we're taught about the ancient Egyptian empire, we're taught about pharaohs and pyramids, and so we're given a test on pharaohs and pyramids. And then we never ever have to think about pharaohs and pyramids again. The problem and its solution are never far apart. That's what we learn. That's the message that we take home. That's the message that's imprinted back here in the lizard brain Anytime you are presented with a problem, the solution must have just been shown to you. So therefore, all you have to do is think about what you were just taught. What did I just learn? What did I just read? That must somehow contain the solution. Think about this for a second. You're working. You're out there working somewhere and the boss says, hey, I want you to go to a training class. I want you to go to this .NET Developer Days here in Warsaw. And you say, sounds good, boss. I'm on my way. And you get here, and suddenly Dino Esposito stands up here and says, oh, domain-driven design, it is amazing. And he waves his hands like this. <laughs> I love you, Dino. Mwah. But he's teaching you about domain-driven design, and you're like, that all makes sense, awesome, that's so totally cool. And then you go back to work. You spend some time talking to Dino in the hallway, you're like, yeah, DDD, I get it. Okay, context, and we got this bounded context. Yeah, no, this all makes sense. You go home, and the boss says, okay, now I need you to work on a project. And what immediately leaps to mind? Oh, I gotta do it with DDD. Boss says, okay, I want you to uh, you know, build an HR time tracking system. You think, DDD. 
Boss says, hey, I, um, I'm thinking maybe we need to build a, uh, 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 like a video streaming system. You think DDD. Boss says, hey, I want to build a Heroes of the Storm clone. And you think DDD. <laughs> the problem, because remember, this is what you learned. The problem and the solution are never far apart. So whatever you just learned must be the answer. Part of the reason we do this is because real world problems are difficult to solve. I mean, let's be honest, right? Consider for just a moment, the boss wants you to build a very, very simple website that has some data that you can put some data in, get some data out, do some simple reporting, a few transformations, blah, blah, blah. Very simple system. And the boss says to you, use whatever you want, anything you want, language, platform, operating system, database, use whatever you want. How in God's name do you decide? Because remember, you could use anything, right? You could use .NET, maybe that's what you're familiar with. So then do you use web forms? Do you use ASP.NET MVC? Do you do this whole thing with a single, uh, single page application framework using ASP.NET to do uh, web API services? Do you store this in SQL Server? Do you store this in MongoDB? Do you store this in DocumentDB? Do you host this on Azure? Do you host this on-prem? There's all these possibilities, and that's just for .NET. Remember, boss said you could use anything. So you're thinking, you know, I haven't spent any time with Ruby and Rails recently. Maybe I'll go spend some time with Ruby and Rails. I'll go do that. Or you decide you're going to investigate this Node.js thing. Or you decide to go after Python and Django. Or, or, or just a huge number of possibilities. And you want to be fair. You want to actually look at all of these, which one is the best to use, which then brings you to the next possible problem, which is to say the problem is complicated enough that this is actually going to be kind of hard. Even for a simple website, what criteria do I use to judge the building of this website? The amount of time it takes me to build it, the ability for this thing to be able to be scale, or the number of people able to maintain it, the number of lines of code, by what criteria do we judge our possible solution? Between the two of these, it actually turns out to be really, really difficult to do an exhaustive search. And that's assuming it's a problem you understand fairly well. Let's change it up a little bit. Boss comes to you and says, hey, we need to build a website because we are going to host the next World Cup. We're going to host all the statistics, and we're going to host all the video, and we're going to host all the results, and literally billions of people will be hitting our website. Go. And you think to yourself, first of all, oh, cool. And then you think to yourself, Oh, shit. <laughs> how do I do this? Because think about this. How do you judge a system at scale? I mean, how do you, how do you build a system that will support billions of people hitting this website simultaneously? I mean, this is not easy. Hell, it's hard enough for a venue to be able to host enough Wi-Fi so that 900 people plus expos, plus speakers, plus conference staff can all live on the Wi-Fi simultaneously. That's non-trivial. Billions of people will be hitting our servers. How are we going to get this to respond quickly? How are we going to get this to, in fact, be able to deliver the results? How are we going to be able to update the data so that everybody can see the latest? Whoa, this is really hard. So... I can use any technology, right, boss? Yep, use anything you want. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spin up Azure, and I'm going to see how easy it is to spin up like 100,000 nodes in Azure. And if I can do that, boom, we'll do it in Azure. Because to actually figure out how you're going to simulate a billion people hitting your website, that's really hard. Maybe we'll do the closest thing. All right, everybody at the company, on the count of three, all of you hit return on your web browser at the same time, and we'll see how well that works. And if it works, great, ship it. This is how some companies do load testing. You know who you are. The number of possible solutions is so large as to forbid an exhaustive search 
and the problem is so complicated, we have to use such simplified models of the problem. We seek shortcuts because at the end of the day, we have to actually ship something. We have to do something. We've got to come up with some kind of answer. What we're doing internally is we're creating an evaluation function. I'm looking at the problem and I'm saying, okay, it's gonna have these kinds of variables, it's gonna have these kinds of, of inputs and so forth. And that evaluation function is how I'm going to arrive at some kind of an answer. Now, part of the thing is, this is not like a mathematical function. This, a, this is something that's kind of abstract and living in your head. And attempts to try to write it down will often result in frustration because, yeah, I, I, I know I kind of want this, but I also kind of want that, but I also kind of want this other thing. Is C Sharp easier to read than Java or Ruby? Eh, I just know it feels more familiar. There's some intuition that goes into this function. But in many cases, when we start talking about these kinds of problems, the evaluation function is noisy. It's hard to get a clear answer. Which one is better, ASP.NET Web uh, API or JAX-RS from the Java space? Well, I mean, if you know both languages and platforms, they kind of look the same thing. There's these little things that might make you lean one way or the other, but for the most part, it kind of feels like a push. And then you throw Ruby and Rails in there or Node.js and Express, and wow, uh, I could solve it with any of them. So there's no real clear winner. And the worst part of it is, the data changes over time. A buddy of mine, many, many years ago, Neil Ford, friend of mine from ThoughtWorks, he wrote a book, Manning Publications, The Art of Java Web Development. It's a lovely book, this incredibly tattooed guy on, on the cover. And um, we made fun of the fact that that was him on the cover with all the tattoos and whatnot. You do that for any Manning book. And the funny thing was, Neil spent probably about a year or so writing this book, and the idea was he was gonna take the top six Java web frameworks, and he was gonna show how to do the same application in each one of them. The book was published, and within three months, it was out of date. Because one of the frameworks released a new major version and made that chapter completely irrelevant. And then within another three months, the next one did, and within another three months, the next one did. And this happens on a regular basis. Any book you buy today on .NET Core will be worthless within six months. I hate to say it, but it's true. The industry keeps marching on. And so even if you decided you wanted to do this exhaustive search of all the possibilities, by the time you finished evaluating each one, the results would be meaningless because somewhere in the background there, one of them will have changed. Because unfortunately, we can't just do a stop the world on the whole world and freeze all development across the industry while we figure out which framework we're gonna use. Would be nice sometimes, but it doesn't happen. The possible solutions are so heavily constrained, constructing even one feasible answer is difficult. This last one though, the person solving the problem is inadequately prepared or imagines some psychological barrier. Boss says to you, hey, I want you to build a website that will scale to billions of people. How many of you feel absolutely rock solid confident that you could do that? Show of hands. No hands up that I can see. One hand and it's kind of like this, eh, don't call on me. Don't bring me up on stage, please. The rest of you, yeah, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. A billion people? Eh, I could maybe do a million on a good day. <laughs> maybe half a million, especially, you know, if, if like Ghana is playing. Nobody cares about Ghana, right? Right, I don't know. Eh, well, you know, maybe psychological barrier. You could figure this out. There's no question whatsoever. You could figure this out. But if you don't feel like you could figure this out, if you don't feel like somebody else has already blazed this trail so that you can kind of follow what they did, wow, gosh, that's, geez, and bet my career on it, you said, boss? Yeah, <laughs> why don't you give it to like Fred over there in the next cube? I'm sure he, he's been talking about wanting a challenge. Yeah, yeah, you go, Fred. No, go on, man, you could do this. Yeah, you got it. You go. 
There's the cliff. Just go right over it. <laughs> Given the fact that there's a lot of complexity in trying to find a solution to one of these problems, the first thing the brain does is it starts looking for shortcuts. It starts looking for ways to try to bypass all of this really heavy, heavy lifting. And if we're going to look at a problem and we're going to think about how to try to solve it, and we're going to try to figure out how to solve it such that we know that it's a relatively proven solution, idea. Why don't we find the people who taught us about this stuff, and why don't we do what they do? Right? You guys love this idea. Because you're not sure how to use link, so what do you do? You go on to Stack Overflow, and you ask John Skeet, and John Skeet will write your link query for you. And it works, and you're like, oh, this is awesome. I'm just going to let John Skeet answer all of my questions from now on. The wife says, hey, what do you like for dinner? You're like, dear John Skeet. <laughs> Surely the teachers, they know the right answers. I I I'm sorry. They know the best practices, right? Best practices. Who in here loves the idea of best practices? Because best practices mean I don't have to think anymore. Best practices mean I can't be fired. Because if it's an industry best practice, who cares if it's right? Everybody else is doing it, so I can't possibly be fired. That's awesome. So please, teacher, teach us. All right. But before we do that, let's talk about teachers for a little bit. Now, bearing in mind that that's an American president, and I'm not in the United States, he's still one of the more popular U.S. presidents. He's frequently taught as part of American history, and as a matter of fact, history tends to be pretty, pretty positive about him. 28th president of the United States, if you read American high school history textbooks, they will use phrases like great reformer and man of peace. If you go up to the White House website, developed a program of progressive reform, asserted international leadership in building a new world order. Yeah, there's that phrase. By virtue of the slogan, he kept us out of war. He narrowly won re-election. This was uh, World War I, right? World War I, of course, uh, Germany, France, Britain kind of got into it, right? Kind of, you know, killed a whole bunch of people. And the United States stayed out of the war for the first two and a half years, and then with the sinking of the Lusitania, the popular opinion in the U.S. turned, and after Wilson won re-election, after campaigning on a promise of staying out of the war, he then was effectively convinced to start dispatching American troops up to the northern end of the Western Front. The influx of new troops is frequently considered as one of the reasons why the Germans later decided to you know, sue for peace and surrender. World War I. After the election, he decided America could remain neutral in the World War. Sounds like a pretty positive guy, right? Right? Yeah. This is what he actually did during his presidency. Invaded Mexico ten times, invaded Haiti, occupied the Dominican Republic, occupied Panama, dispatched troops to Nicaragua, put down a rebellion, sent 11,000 troops to Russia to fight the communists, sent U.S. warships to blockade Russia. This is the man of peace. This is what we're taught, is the great reformer, the great man of peace kept us out of war. Well, okay, maybe, maybe he wasn't quite as peaceful as all that. The great reformer... Oh, shit. His Republican predecessors. And remember, Republicans in the United States, those are the guys on the right side. Those are the guys who resist change. And remember, during this time frame, I mean, you know, America had just a couple years prior finished our civil war over slavery. He was born, actually, during the Civil War. Republican predecessors routinely appointed blacks to important offices. Wilson changed all that. He was an outspoken white supremacist. Wilson used his power of chief executive to segregate the federal government, used the, ex the excuse of anti-communism to surveil and undermine black newspapers. This is a great quote. Any man who carries a hyphen about with him 
And that requires a little bit of explanation. In the US, we frequently talk about people of mixed heritage. We will talk about African Americans. We will talk about Asian Americans. You would be referred to as Polish Americans. If you happen to have a child in the US, they would be Polish Americans, etc. We put this hyphen right in front, your heritage dash Americans. Any man who carries a hyphen about with him, said Wilson, carries a dagger that he is ready to plunge into the vitals of this republic whenever he gets ready. Wow. This is the great reformer. And he's a Democrat, by the way. Let's try some other history. The, the Vietnam War, the U.S. engagement in Vietnam, was, if you read it in any textbook today, not a popular decision. The protests across college campuses, the, the protests outside the White House, it is routinely seen as a turning point in American history where Americans no longer trusted their government and no longer trusted them to be able to guide them effectively through uh, conflicts and so forth. In 1971, now remember, this is actually after the Tet Offensive, three years after the Tet Offensive, when all of the U.S.'s supposed gains were completely shown to be negligible. I mean, supposedly we were you know, patriating the country, making it peaceful, and instead the Viet Cong showed up and killed anybody they wanted, any time they wanted, anywhere they wanted. Really a downer if you're the U.S. government. Three years after that, a poll is conducted, and the idea is, you are asked, are you for or against withdrawing troops? Now, the popular perception is the college-educated individuals, the ones who are most educated about the way the world works, the ones who are supposedly the most liberal, would be for pulling troops from Vietnam. And those who are not college-educated would be against, stay the course, et cetera, et cetera. Because the educated are liberal and the uneducated are conservative. And so, how many college educated were for? How many high school educated were for? How many grade school were for? Well, the actual results that came back, the less education you had, the more you wanted to get the hell out of Vietnam. This completely flies in the face of most people's analysis of popular reaction to the Vietnam War today. Most of the time, we still think, the college educated, the college campuses, this is where protests happen. They're the ones who don't want war, and the ones who benefit manufacturing and so forth would want war. But 80%, four in five, down to college educated, three in five. I mean, there's a 20% gap there, and that's three years after the moment where the US was clearly shown to be losing. Take this to a more recent, to our involvement in Iraq. Thank you, President Bush. Two-thirds of all Americans who graduated from college favored keeping troops in Iraq long enough to bring stability, while 61% with less than a high school degree favored a quick pullout. Okay, so I like history. But what does this have to do with the whole enterprise thing? Well. Let's do a little bit of our own history. If you were around in the year 2000 writing code, you heard about this thing called Java 2 Enterprise Edition, J2EE. -E. Um, if you were a .NET programmer, actually you weren't a .NET programmer because .NET really hadn't been invented yet. They were working on it. They had announced the beta of it, but they hadn't released it yet. You were a COM programmer. You heard about this thing. And in many cases, people spoke very glowingly of it. And if you talk to people, what they said was, oh, this enterprise Java bean stuff, this is amazing, this is incredible. This is like the, the best thing ever, right? You read the Java 2 Enterprise Edition specification, fast moving and demanding world of e-commerce and information technology has put a new kind of pressure on application developers. Oh yeah, I'm feeling that pressure, yeah, oh yeah. Enterprise applications have to be designed, built, and produced for less money, faster, and with fewer resources. Now, who is not down for this, by the way? Seriously, who wants to see applications cost more money, be built slower, and require more resources? Right? 
Component-based, multi-tiered, distributed application model, reused components, unified security model, flexible transaction control. Dude, sign me up. This EJB shit sounds awesome. And it got to the point, very literally, where people were really thinking about this. They were, they were putting this up for everything, right? Simplified architecture and development, simplified scaling of distributed applications without requiring any effort. That phrase actually shipped. No effort on your part. See, that was the big promise, right? We'll just develop these components, throw them into this container. The container, we can just turn it up, right? If we decide we want more of them, we just ask the container to do more of them. Wait, am I talking about EJB or am I talking about Docker? I can't tell anymore. Anyway, it got to the point where we were so, so convinced that this was like the solution for everything. I mean, you'd walk up to, you know, you're a consultant, and you walk into a, uh, an organization and they say, we need to build a enterprise class uh, HR application, and you said EJB. Or we need to build an enterprise class e-commerce system, EJB. Or we need to build an online developer portal, EJB. I need to build World of Warcraft, EJB. It really got to the point as a child attending Sunday school, I often came to understand that the answer to every question was always Jesus. Who loves you? Jesus. Who saved you? Jesus. Who died for you? Jesus. Who will make a sandwich if you pray for it? Jesus. I really got to the point where I thought EJB stood for Enterprise Jesus Beans. And of course, this picture here, right, everybody's got a picture like it somewhere in their archives. I mean, change the labels, and this could be a picture of a .NET app, could be a picture of a Node app. These could be microservices. Those could be containers, right? Because at the end of the day, this is like the universal software architecture, box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. <laughs> it's every architecture ever. So of course, we look at that EJB stuff and we reject it completely, totally out of hand, right? Because clearly Sun and Microsoft, when Microsoft kind of did this .NET thing and they didn't get it right and Sun didn't get it right, nobody gets it right because they're all stupid. But that begs the question, if we reject today all of these heavy application server-based technologies, and don't get me wrong, that's exactly what a lot of people are suggesting. The whole microservices architecture, the whole container-driven thing, it's all about decentralizing, where before we were talking about centralizing and piling it all in one space. Why did we bite so hard? Why did so many people put so much money into the idea that somehow JWE or .NET Transaction Services, or SQL Server, or whatever became before it, this could save us. Why do we keep biting so hard on technologies that we're convinced will save us? Teachers, it turns out, are amazingly effective things. Now this may be tricky for many of you because English is not your first language. But I'd be willing to bet that a good many of you can actually read that sentence. The solution is here. I'm not going to make you solve this one the hard way. It turns out... Oh, dang it, I thought I pulled that from there. Oh, well. It turns out, psychologists have done studies, that if you pull the vowels out of words, People can still understand what you're saying with amazing accuracy. As a matter of fact, and I presume this holds for most languages, but I know they've done the study that for English, as long as the first letter and the last letter are the same, you can mix up the intermediate letters however you'd like, and people will still get it. The brain can piece all of this stuff together with amazing split-second accuracy. It's absolutely uncanny. This here, what are those two words? The cat. How the hell do you know that? 
Because if you look at those middle letters, those are exactly the same letter. And I promise you they're the same letter because I deliberately cut and paste one to the other. Why is that not te chit or te cat or the chit? Because it just isn't, man. Why question? The way the human brain works, it's absolutely amazing. It operates off of this notion of what they call activations. Things which are closely related will frequently get nestled together inside the huge, huge network of, of axites, axites and dendrites inside of the brain. And so when something similar to what you understand is presented to you, immediately activations fire. It's like this little spidering effect around that particular thing. And all these other things come to mind. This happens all the time. When somebody says the word enterprise, activations fire. And immediately you think, big honking relational database, web browser, client server, application servers, POJOs, and all the other things that are going through your head right frickin' now. And don't deny it, it's going through your head. You are thinking about this stuff. You're prejudiced. You don't know anything about the problem. You don't know anything about why I brought up the word enterprise. The fact that I said enterprise, immediately you leapt to that picture. Universal software diagram. Box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. You went there immediately. You're prejudiced. You're a technicist. I made this word up. It's all right. I own it. If you use it, you owe me a quarter. Judgments of technology are based on criteria not inherent in its own abilities. One whose love of X is exceeded only by their dislike of Y. I admit it. I'm a technicist. Pearl sucks. I said it. I said it. If I'm elected president, we will immediately build a wall around Larry Wall and all the Pearl programmers will be thrust out of the country, all like five remaining of them. <laughs> Any COBOL lovers out there? Don't admit it, you'll get thrown out of the conference. Seriously, we all of us have these little technicist reactions. We've all had them. People continue to have them. It's not uncommon to go to a .NET show and hear somebody talking about how terrible Java is. And then you say, well, like, which version of Java did you program against? Oh, I never used Java. Well, then how would you know it's terrible? Oh, because, like, my friend's cousin's brother's dog wrote Java one day. <laughs> and it was terrible. How many of you have actually used C++? Show of hands. Yeah, so the rest of you that were laughing at the C++ jokes, you're a technicist. Because you just heard how terrible it was. You never actually experienced the joy of pointers or delete. But you've heard, I, I understand it's terrible, etc. So let's go back to the original question. When we start thinking about, all right, what do we need to do? What do I need to know? What's the important thing that I need to have as I think about what I'm going to do post this conference, how do I put all of this stuff into legacy, et cetera? How do, I, how do I figure out all of these things? How do I rethink enterprise? Resist the temptation of the familiar. Ever walked up to a programming language or platform, looked at some of the syntax, and said, oh, yeah, this looks just like dot, dot, dot. And so, therefore, it must be just like dot, dot, dot. How many of you have ever walked into a project and thought to yourself, oh, yeah, I've done this project before? Or even better, how many of you are actually asked to port the project? We've got this legacy system we built in C++ 25 years ago. Now we need to port it to .NET. And we swear it's just going to be, we, we just want the same application. We just want it in .NET as opposed to C++. We're not going to change any bugs. Well, except for maybe that one. Oh, and that other one. 
Oh yeah, and marketing wants this new feature thrown in. Oh, and yeah, sales needs this other data captured. Oh, and the database is gonna be a little bit different because resist the temptation to believe that everything you've seen, you've seen before. There are always going to be certain circumstances that are going to be different. There's never gonna be something that's 100% identical to what you've seen before. It may feel like it. And there may be some percentage of it that is the same. Yes, Java and C Sharp share very similar syntax. So does C++. But they are, in fact, some very different languages with some very different things happening under the hood. And the more you think that they're just the same, the less you're going to be able to pick up on those subtle nuances and differences. Most of all, reject the goal of reuse. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a, a company, a project, a scenario, and somebody has said, oh yeah, yeah, we're building out this thing and we're making the code reusable. Okay, before you can make something reusable, you have to make it usable. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Because, quite frankly, there are a lot of C++ developers who never did. The joke was always that VB developers were so focused on shipping solutions, they'd ship the same solution five times. And C++ developers were so focused on building reusable code, they never actually shipped any usable code. And they're both right. There's a continuum here. There is a line. But in the patterns community, we don't call a pattern a pattern until we've seen it show up three times. You're thinking, I want to, I want to write some code that's reusable. Dude, just use it first. Then see if somebody else writes the same code. Then see if somebody else writes the same code again. And once you've got three data points, now you've got a nice sampling from whence you can start to draw abstractions and figure out how to make this reusable. Simply building reusable code that you only use once is also called building an application. You're not accomplishing anything except wasting a bunch of time. Reject the idea that we're building reusable code until I actually know how I'm going to reuse it. Resist the temptation of the familiar. Befriend the uncomfortable truth, also known as be cynical. Question, demand, investigate. When somebody stands up here on stage and says, dude, X is the best thing ever. X will make all of your problems go away. Whether it's DDD, CQRS, whether it's Azure, whether it's Amazon Web Services, whether it's Google Cloud, whether it's C Sharp, whether it's whatever, your immediate reaction would be, really, prove it. Show me. And more important, look for the areas where they don't mesh, where they don't match. All right, so if Google Cloud is really good for these things, what is it not good for? Or if CQRS can handle these kinds of projects, name for me a project that CQRS won't do particularly well. Where are the edges? Where are the limits? Because to this day, there has never been any one technology that has always been a one-size-fits-all solution. Never in the history of computer science. So in your case, you need to start looking for where the edges of this thing lie. And if you don't, they will bite you in some way. Eschew the best practice. There are no such things. Let's just agree right now. There is no such thing as a best practice. Not in computer science, not in life. There's no such thing as a best practice in life. I've given this keynote a couple of times before, and at one conference where I was doing this, and I said there are no such things as best practices in life, there was a guy in the audience in the front row, which is why I know it's one of you guys. He stood up and said, that's not true. I said, really? He said, absolutely, there are best practices in life. I said, okay, name one. He said, breathing. 
I said, oh yeah? He's like, yeah, breathing. I said, underwater? <laughs> See, there are practices. And breathing is usually a good thing to do, don't get me wrong. But when you're underwater, you got to change it up a little bit. you got to hold your breath. Or you got to wear the scuba equipment, the tanks, and the rebreather, and all of that stuff. Or you got to have the snorkel or something. See, the thing of it is, context matters. What industry best practice actually gets you is not the best, but merely the average. When a decision causes you to develop software at a fraction of the rate of more aggressive competitors, best practice is a misnomer. Because do you know what happens? If you have discovered a best practice that you can apply universally, so has everybody else. And they will do it, because that's the interesting thing. This industry is filled with smart people. You are not the only smart person in your company, much less within the industry. And so if you found something that universally works all the time, everybody will start to do it. There is no such thing as a best practice. There are practices, there are solutions that will fit certain problems within a certain context that will yield certain consequences, but that's what we call a pattern. That is almost literally the gang of four format. Problem, solution, context, consequences with a name on it for easy reference. The problem I have here is with the word best. Best implies everybody would always do it all the time. If you say, okay, well, there are practices, I'm with you. I'm right there with you. There are definitely practices. DDD is a practice. CQRS is a practice. Event sourcing is a practice. But don't put that best on them because there are some scenarios for which DDD is not a good solution or not the best solution for your organization or not the best solution for this particular tactic or technology or project or what have you. Most of the time, best practice, when somebody up here starts talking about industry best practice or when somebody out there asks me questions about best practice, what I'm hearing is, please teach me how to stop thinking. Because if it's a best practice, then I don't have to worry about it anymore. Everybody else is doing it, so therefore I'm safe. It's the safe thing to do. Embrace the perennial gale of creative destruction. Alan Greenspan, who was the uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary for a number of years under Bill Clinton, presided over some of the most uh, prosperous, basically over the most prosperous cycle in American history. Alan Greenspan, in his biography, talks about the gale of creative destruction. A market economy will incessantly revitalize itself from within by scrapping old and failing businesses and then reallocating resources to newer, more productive ones. In other words, periodically, something will come along and wipe out an industry. And it sucks for the people in that industry. It's terrible. People lose jobs. People can't fend for their families anymore. It's terrible. That's why it's a gale. It's a storm. It's destructive. But by wiping out the old, we make room for the new. And it's terrible to have to live through it, but the benefits that come after the fact are usually pretty cool. Much of Europe was wiped out after World War II, and it got rebuilt. And in many cases, the cities that were rebuilt were rebuilt with more modern approaches in hand. The United States flattened Japan I mean, we absolutely leveled that country from one end to the other. As a matter of fact, we nuked it twice. And then we can't figure out why nobody trusts us with nuclear weapons. But we rebuilt it. And Japan has been a leading manufacturer of electronics ever since. It sucked to be a Japanese citizen in 1946. It was actually pretty cool to be a Japanese citizen in 1966 and really cool in 86 when they really started to dominate the market in electronics. Most of the chips and so forth that we use in our electronic devices today are manufactured in Japan. 
The perennial gale of creative destruction cycles through our industry on a frighteningly regular basis. And if you're not cool with that, if you're not comfortable with that, I don't blame you because nobody likes change. The brain does not like change. The amygdala prefers the familiar. But I got to tell you right now, if you're not comfortable with change, this is the wrong industry to be in. We are constantly reinventing things. We are constantly reevaluating things. We are constantly looking at new and better ways. And yeah, sometimes this means that as a .NET programmer, you're going to have to stand up and say, I should go maybe learn that Node.js thing. Or maybe I should go investigate Java. Or maybe I should pick up some of these NoSQLs. Because who knows what's happening next? This comes through, and unfortunately, there's, there's absolutely no way to predict what will happen next. There really isn't. I hate to say it. Who would have predicted Uber? I mean, think about it. Ten years ago, I'm going to tell you that somebody's going to come along and create a mobile app that will completely disrupt the taxi cab industry. Who believes me? I'm going to have a mobile application that will actually allow you to rent a mom to come to your apartment and give you chicken soup. It's Uber for moms. And it's a real thing in New York. Because moms needed to be disrupted, I guess. These things come along, and some of them, some of them are ridiculous and stupid. Some of them die out a natural death. But some of them stick around. Some of them park like Hurricane Katrina over a place and they just wipe out everything underneath it. That happened to C++. Java came through and totally stole all of C++'s thunder. Right about the time that C++ was really starting to get people to think about objects, Java came through, stole that thunder, and kept going. And Bjarne Ostrustrup is still pissed about it. It happens. So what do you do? Create an evaluation function of your own. Context matters. You jump onto a mailing list and you ask, hey, what do you guys think about this n-hibernate thing? And one guy responds, oh, it's great, it's amazing, you, you can't go wrong using it. Another person responds and says, it's terrible. Don't even get close to it. It's, 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 it's crap. And then they start arguing. N-hibernate, stored procedures. You guys have all seen the flame wars around a bunch of this stuff. Because if you were to dig into the past behind these guys, you'll discover that one of them was trying to use nHibernate on a new project with no existing database. So he could design the tables and columns and so forth exactly the way nHibernate wanted it to be. Whereas the other guy was inheriting a brownfield database that was designed in the 80s. And trying to map and hibernate over to that was just an absolute mess. And now you begin to understand why one of them loves it and the other one hates it. Context always matters. So when somebody up here stands up and says, hey, this technology, it's great, it's awesome, it's wonderful, you should use it, blah, blah, blah. Even if they put qualifiers on it, who knows whether that applies to you. You have that responsibility. You have to create that evaluation function that says, for my context, my company builds these kinds of applications. The industry I choose to be in builds e-commerce, or we build digital creative media, or we do uh, content streaming, or we build developer portals, or whatever that is. You need to create that context so that you can run technologies through that evaluation function. In some cases, it can be very simple. How would I build a particular game on a, on a mobile application using a different mobile framework each time? Or sometimes you build a little bit larger thing. I want to build a system that will allow me to track the number of people that are part of an organization so that I can send out emails and whatnot. I want to build a directory, a phone book, if you will, on the web. What technologies do I use to do that? What kind of problems would that phone book create, et cetera, et cetera? Because believe me, people can stand up here and talk really easily. As one who does it, I tell you, it's really easy to stand up here and say whatever the heck I want. Pearl sucks. 
And you don't know why I think that, but because I'm up here and you're out there, you're like, oh yeah, no, I get it, totally. Pearl socks, yeah. And you're going to go back to the office and you're going to talk to friends, you're going to go talk to your boss, your boss is going to say, yeah, one of the system administrators wrote this Pearl script, and you're going to go, dude, Pearl sucks. The boss is going to go, really? He's like, oh yeah, I heard it at this conference. This guy up on stage, he had long hair, so you know he's right. You've got to decide for yourself. You've got to build that context, that evaluation function for yourself. Do the homework. Play with it. Explore. Experiment. Most of all, remember why you're doing this. Attend to the goals. What does your company do for a living? How do you make money? How does your company make money? That's really the question if you're thinking about this technology in terms of your company. How does your company make money? Does this technology help your company make more money? Does it make it easier for, company to, for, the, for the company to better control its costs? Does it improve its profits? Does it somehow generate new customers? Improve the sales cycle? Better generate marketing? How does your company make money? How do you make money? Because at the end of the day, that's really, when we talk about doing this stuff in a professional context, you want to go home and you want to write Flappy Bird on a phone, you go for it, man. I, 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 who cares what you do at that point, if, unless that's how you make money, and then you're a professional game developer. Most of us in this room are not. So how does your company make money? How would this technology help your company make more money? Or maybe you don't care about money. Maybe you still live with your parents. It's cool. It's all right. My kid does too. He's a game developer, by the way. So it's okay. Maybe you don't care about money. Maybe for you it's really about improving the world around you. And that's cool. That's awesome. That's your goal. How does this technology help improve the world around you? How does this technology help you improve the world around you? Whatever your goals are. And if you're not sure, well, then it's time to define a few. Make no mistake about it. People will sometimes come to a conference because they want to learn about a technology, because they want to be the guy or girl on stage. And that is awesome. So you come, you learn about a thing, and you want to become the, perennial, the, the, the preemptive expert on that thing. That is awesome. I encourage that. That then becomes your goal. And now the context of everything else changes because now you're focused on this thing. You like this thing. You want to see this thing succeed because you want your name to ride with this thing. That's cool. You at least know what you're going after. If you're not interested in being up here on stage, writing books, doing talks, etc., then what are your goals? I can't tell you. I can tell you what mine are, but I can't tell you what yours are. You need to define those because once you've defined those goals, then you can look at what you're doing and you can see whether or not you're still sticking to those goals. Our company really wants to build applications that are much richer in quality, much stronger. They will stand up to the test of time, which means we probably want to have a much deeper focus on testing, which means then that whatever technologies we look at next had best be testable. Neil Ford, the buddy of mine I mentioned earlier from ThoughtWorks, big, big company, big on unit testing. Neil's quote, if I can't unit test it, it is dead to me. Does your company care about quality? Does your company care about making sure you can unit test stuff? Then that needs to be one of the goals that you throw into your evaluation function whenever you evaluate stuff. Do you care about mobile? Do you care about server, cloud, serverless, whatever? define the goals, evaluate the technologies in the face of those goals, and then look back to see if you're still sticking to the goals in question. So, how do I rethink enterprise? I have no idea. I'm serious. I know how I do it. I know how I do it from my context. But remember, context matters. There is no spoon.
There is no right answer. There is no one solution. There is no one thing I can point you towards to say, do that and I guarantee you, you'll never be fired. Because this industry constantly rebuilds itself on a daily basis. Who would have thought 15 years ago that we would all be carrying around these pocket supercomputers? 40 years ago, we never imagined the internet. I can't tell you how to rethink enterprise because you have to do it for you. Define your goals, evaluate technologies against those goals, make sure that you're continuing to periodically look at those goals to make sure you're sticking with it, and keep going. Lather, rinse, repeat. There is no one answer. Much as I wish there was, believe me, I could make a ton of money if I could just give you one answer and this keynote would have been over a long time ago. No, that's not true. I'd have filled it with something. Go.